Let's talk about finding the zeros of a polynomial function using the Descartes rule of signs, the integral lower or upper bounds, the rational root theorem, and the remainder theorem. Here is our problem for today. Find the roots of p of x equals x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 19x squared plus 11x plus 30. In order to find the roots of this polynomial function, we can employ some theorems that can narrow down our search for the roots. One of them is to use the Descartes rule of signs. If you let f of x be a polynomial function with real coefficients, meaning the coefficient a sub n is a real number, a sub n minus 1 is a real number, a sub 1 is a real number, and a sub 0 is a real number, then the number of positive real zeros is either equal to the number of sign changes of f of x or is less than the number of sign changes by an even integer. And the number of negative real zeros is either equal to the number of sign changes of f of negative x or is less than the number of sign changes by an even integer. Let me demonstrate the meaning of Descartes' rule of sign using our problem. Let's count the number of sign changes in our given polynomial. So here you have positive x to the fourth going to positive x to the third. There is no sign change. So there is zero sign change here. From positive to negative, there is one sign change. From negative to positive, there is also another sign change. From positive to positive, there is no sign change. So we have a total of two sign changes. And according to Descartes' rule of sign, we can expect two positive roots or less than this number by an even integer. What are the even integers? The even integers are 2, 4, 6, and so on. That means if I subtract 2 by 2, I get 0. I can also have 0 positive real root. If I subtract 2 minus 4, that gives us negative number, so we'll just ignore those negative numbers. Therefore, we expect to get either 2 positive real roots or 0 positive real root. Let us organize the number of positive, negative, and imaginary roots in this table. Since the degree of the given polynomial is fourth degree, using the corollary to the fundamental theorem of algebra, we expect to get a total of four roots. And these four roots could be a combination of positive real root, negative real root, and imaginary roots. And also take note that imaginary roots always come in pair. So we can have two imaginary roots, four imaginary roots, six imaginary roots. But you cannot get one, three, five, seven, and so on imaginary roots. The number of imaginary roots must always be even. So we can expect to get two positive real roots or zero positive real root. But the total is always four. Now for the negative real roots, we find p of negative x. That means replace the variable x with negative x and simplify. And so p of negative x is now equal to x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 19x squared minus 11x plus 30. A faster way of getting p of negative x is whenever you have even exponent, just copy that term. And when you have an odd exponent, change the sign of that term. So here the term preceding x cubed is positive, we make it negative. The term preceding 11x is positive, we make it negative. And all the rest, we just cap it. Then let's count the number of sign changes. From positive to negative, there is one sign change here. From negative to negative, there is no sign change. Negative to negative is no sign change again. From negative to positive is one sign change. And so we have a total of two sign changes of f of negative x. That implies that we can either get two negative real roots or less than this number by an even integer. So 2 minus 2 is 0. We can either get two or zero negative real roots. This table now listed the combination of 
positive, negative, and imaginary roots based on the fact that we can have a maximum of two positive real roots and a maximum of two negative real roots. All in all, we come up with these four possible combinations. Either you have two positive, two negative, and zero imaginary. The total is four roots. The positive roots could be zero. That means the rest are negative and imaginary. An imaginary root must always be even number. If there are two positive and zero negative, there must be two imaginary roots. If there is no positive real root and no negative real root, then all the roots must be imaginary. So the Descartes rule of sign just tells us the nature of the sign of roots that we are expecting. But this does not tell us what are the roots. So we need to use the other theorems. The next theorem that we are going to use is the rational root theorem. In the rational root theorem, it says that the possible rational roots of a polynomial function is a factor of the ratio of this constant and the coefficient of the leading term. So the ratio of 30 over 1. And what are the factors of 30 over 1? All the possible factors of 30 over 1 are listed here. A total of 16 possible rational roots. And take note that we are looking for four possible roots, either positive, real, negative, real, or imaginary. But here, we have 16 possible candidates for the rational roots alone. So we need to narrow down the number of roots. If we are going to plot all those possible real roots on the number line, this is what we saw. Let's remove the label so we can make it more readable. Our function is an even function because the highest degree is x to the fourth. Roughly speaking, we can imagine that the graph of our function can probably look like this. It's possible that this graph will not cross the x-axis. In that case, we have imaginary roots. It's possible that the graph will cross the x-axis. And the points of intersection represent the zeros or the roots of the polynomial function. Notice that from this point going here, the function just keeps going up. And at the left side, from this point going up, the function just keeps going up. This implies that from this point going to the right, there are no longer roots. And at the left, from this point going to the left, there are no more roots to expect. And so, we can now say that there could be an upper bound here, and there also could be a lower bound for the real roots of this polynomial at the left side. And if we can identify this lowest integral upper bound and this highest integral lower bound, then we can narrow down our search for the roots in this part. That is what we are going to do in our next slides. So let's search now for the upper bound. For practical reason, it is not good to test 30 because if we found 30 to be an upper bound, this has no use because anyway, 30 is really at the right side. But if we can find, let's say, if we choose positive 5, and if it happens that 5 is an upper bound, then we can eliminate 6, 10, 15, and 30 for the possible roots of the function. Also for the lower bound, if we can identify a lower bound, let's say negative 6, and it happens that negative 6 is indeed a lower bound, then we can eliminate negative 10, negative 15, and negative 30 for the possible candidates for the real roots. So that's the function of identifying the upper bound. We want to narrow down our list of possible real roots. So let's do that. So let's test if 5 is an upper bound. In order to do that, we are going to perform synthetic division, and we are going to look at the signs of the terms in the last row. If all the signs in the last row are positive, then we will conclude that whatever is our divisor that divisor is an upper bound of the polynomial function. So let's perform our synthetic division. 
Let's bring down 1, multiply it by 5 to get 5. Get the sum of 1 and 5 to get 6, multiply it by 5 to get 30. Then add to get 11, multiply by 5 to get 55. Get the sum to get 66 and multiply by 5 to get 330. And finally, get the sum to get 390. Look at the signs of our numbers at the last row. You have positive 1, positive 6, positive 11, positive 66, and positive 390. All of them are positive numbers. Because these are all positive, our conclusion is 5 is an upper bound. And so, we can now eliminate all these possible rational roots, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30, because we know that 5 is an upper bound. The function will just keep going higher and higher after x equals 5, and the graph will no longer turn down to intersect the x-axis. Just using this one test, we now narrow down the possible number of rational roots from 16 down to 11. If we try the next integer lesser than 5, that is 4, Notice that if we perform the synthetic division, the last row also are all positive, which means that 4 is also an upper bound. Now let's try positive 3. Using synthetic division, notice that the last number here, which is the remainder, is 0. So using now the remainder theorem, we now conclude that 3 is a rational root. 3 is not an upper bound, but 3 is the root that we are looking for. So we now found one solution, that is x equals 3. And by knowing that x equals 3 is a solution, then 4 must be the lowest integral upper bound. Any value of x greater than 4 is an upper bound, and 4 is the lowest integral upper bound. Now let's try for negative roots. Let's pick any possible roots here, let's say negative 6. If we try negative 6, notice the signs in the last row. You have 1, negative 5, positive 11, negative 55, and positive 360. There is an alternating signs from positive to negative, to positive to negative, back to positive. When the signs in the last row of the synthetic division when you divide the given polynomial by a negative root is alternating, then this divisor, in this case negative 6, is now a lower bound. It could be positive, negative, positive, negative, or it could be negative, positive, negative, positive, as long as the signs are alternating. Then we say that whatever is the value of our r, that possible root is considered as a lower bound. And that eliminates negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, and negative 15 for all the possible negative roots. By just using these several tests, we now know that our focus for the search of the root should be on this middle part. Because anything to the right of that is an upper bound, and anything to the left of this is a lower bound. We only have to choose among these possible roots that are in circle. And those numbers are 3, 2, 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and negative 5. And previously, we already identified positive 3 as one of the positive roots. And then let's try some of these remaining possible rational roots. Let's go back to the depressed polynomial when we found that 3 is a root. In the depressed polynomial, represented by this 1, 4, negative 7, and negative 10. This negative 10 is the constant, this is the linear term, the quadratic term, and this is the cubic term. So the highest exponent now here is exponent 3. At this point, let's try negative 5. Using negative 5 in our synthetic division, we found that the remainder is 0. This means that negative 5 is one of the roots that we are looking for. So negative 5 is a root. We need two more. But remember, in our Descartes rule of sign, we expect either to have two positive or zero positive. And we also expect to get two negative real roots or zero 
real root. We do not expect to get only one positive or one negative. We are looking for that other positive root. We are looking for that other negative root. Another thing that we can conclude here is if negative 5 is a root and if negative 6 here is a lower bound, then anything to the left of negative 6 cannot be the root. And so negative 6 now must be the highest integral lower bound. There is no more number greater than negative 6 that can be a lower bound for the roots of this polynomial function. Now I want you to focus at the last row of our depressed polynomial. This negative 2 is the constant, this negative 1 is the coefficient of the linear term, and this positive 1 is the coefficient of the quadratic term. So what we have now here is a quadratic depressed polynomial which we can solve using factoring. Notice here that this one is the coefficient of the x squared, this negative one is the coefficient of negative x, and this negative two is this negative two here. So finding now the zeros of this quadratic equation, we can factor the left side as x minus two and x plus one, and solving for x, we got x equals positive two and x equals negative one. Combining these results with the other two roots that we already found, we now have these four roots. Two and three are both positive. Negative one and negative five are the two negative real roots. All in all, we have a total of four roots, which is consistent with the highest degree of our given polynomial equation. And these four real roots are all contained in this circled interval, which we narrow down by applying the integral upper bound and the integral lower bound. And so the roots now of the equation x to the fourth plus x to the third minus 19x squared plus 11x plus 30 equals zero are negative five, negative one, two, and three. The highest integral lower bound is negative six, this part here. And the lowest integral upper bound is four, which is this part here. And going back to the Descartes rule of sign that we use at the start, we have we have here two negative real roots, which is consistent with these two. And we have two positive real roots, which is consistent with these two. And a total of four roots and zero imaginary root. And finally, if you are going to graph now the polynomial function, these four roots that we identified are the following. You have here the negative five, you have here this negative one, you have this positive two, and you have this positive three. Geometrically, all these roots are the x-intercepts of the function. These are the points of intersections between the curve and the x-axis. And for the lower bound negative six, notice that at any point beyond negative six, the graph just keeps going higher and higher. And for the right side, an upper bound of four here indicates that the graph will just keep going higher and higher without turning back anymore to intersect our x-axis. So that is the systematic way of finding the roots of polynomial function because oftentimes when you are solving for the roots of polynomial functions, you do not know among the possible rational roots are the real zeros. You have to narrow down all the possible roots whenever you identify the upper bound and the lower bound, and then you just keep performing synthetic division until you arrive at a zero remainder in order to apply the remainder theorem. And whenever you get a remainder of zero, use the depressed polynomial in order to continue finding all the other possible rational roots. And when you are down to a quadratic depressed polynomial, use quadratic formula, factoring, or any other method to solve quadratic equation in order to find the last two remaining roots. So thank you, thank you very much, and we hope to see you again in our next video.